Welcome to the Jamestown First Baptist Church Worship Hour. Established in 1930, the First Baptist Church has been instrumental in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ across the Cumberland Mountains. An aggressive local missions program has assisted in establishing sister churches in Fentress County, the Pickett State Park area, and Morgan County. With programs to minister to the individual and the family, we invite you to join with us in our live worship service. Good morning. We'd like to welcome you here to services at First Baptist Church. Glad that you could be here to be a part of our services. For those listening by radio or listening by uh, television or whatever, I'm Dwight Dixon and Gary is on the piano and Brother Sam Gamble will be bringing the, the, uh, the message a little, long, a little later in the service. Just a few announcements to go over. Better get my glasses on, Jason, where I can read. Uh, Brother Peggy and Brother Harold and Miss Peggy Camden, they wanted to make sure that everybody knows they've not been coming because they're... Uh, of all the stuff going on, but they are watched by television each week, and they are missing everyone, so we want to make sure that we bring that out. Next weekend, uh, next Saturday, is a baby shower honoring Zoe uh, uh, Crouch Stewart, uh, daughter of Wayne and Kelly Crouch, so that's uh, they're registered at uh, Walmart and different places. They're going to be here at uh, the Church Fellowship Hall from 2 to 4, and so everyone is welcome. Uh, there is... Uh, a list of, you've got a bulletin, there's a list of things uh, there that you can read. Special prayer requests, uh, Bart Neely had uh, eye surgery this week and is recovering from that. Greg Sutherland has uh, liver cancer, Brandy Tompkins, uh, she's still taking treatments for her cancer. Cindy Matthews, Doc Harmon, Brother Donnie's going to have surgery uh, next, a week from Tuesday, meet week from Monday. All right, get my days right. Uh, need to pray, make sure we lift him up at Oak Ridge. Miss Barbara French is, uh, still has some heart issues. Miss Christina Christman recovering from broken ankle. Miss Roberta Neely's got some uh, surgery coming up. Uh, the Ronald Moody family, a lot of them are uh, hurt her in the hospital. And uh, uh, everything with school starting, nobody, everybody don't know no, all the details of how everything's going to happen. We need to pray for our teachers and those that are in charge and pray for our leaders and uh, again the uh, uh, Barbara Pyle and Rhonda Garrett are who we're thanking this week for doing their job in teaching science school and uh, they're different and working in different jobs here in the church and we look for that thank, thank them for that and also the Operation Christmas Child 112 days to collection and they need stuffed animals for boxes and again they meet on Tuesdays uh, from 9 to 12 every Tuesday morning from 9 to 12 so if you would like to be a part of Operation Christmas Child come be a part of that and uh, again Miss Kathy Hardy made these little uh, the contact books for people that uh, maybe not make it all the time so if you would like to take one of those and give one of those a, a, a call uh, we would, they, I know they would appreciate it. Baptist Reflectors are in the back or out here. If you'd like to see what's happening in the, in, on the Baptist and Reflector. And uh, again, the Pastor Search Committee, we're continually meeting. We're looking for a, a God's uh, man for our church. And we're talking to some uh, per, per, per perspective. I'll get it out in a minute, uh, candidates. And so we're moving in the process. And just to give you a heads up, so anyway, things are going well. And just continue to pray for, uh, again, pray for our pastor that we're going to find. Pray for his wife, his children. Pray for the past, the church that he would be leaving. And pray for the pastor search committee that we make sure that we're following God's will and finding the man that would lead our church in, uh, in the next phase and uh, uh, of, of, of the next time period. So we are glad that you're here. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, and this time, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Jason, and he's going to have the scripture reading and have a word of prayer. Again, if you want to do the, your, uh, you can mail in your, t your ties or there's boxes. Uh, we, we took the offering plates down where nobody can think anybody's trying to take it. We've got little lock boxes that you can put your uh, 
uh, offerings in the, the boxes here on the organ or in the back. And so, anyway, we're doing all we can to try to make sure we're social distancing and, and doing what we can to, to help out. So, again, glad that you're here. Smile on everybody's face because when Brother Sam gets up here, he wants to see smiles. So, anyway, Brother Jason. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to read from Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day that you've given us. And Lord, just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings. Uh, Lord, we lift up those to you that, uh, that need you this morning in a special way. We all need you in a special way. But Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand. We pray. <laughs> Are we ready, choir? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, He'll remember us a praise. We all go get to heaven on a day of rejoicing and rejoicing.
be looking for forward to the day that we're going home. Amen. 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 Just look at the world we have today. We're just passing through, right? I am a poor way very stranger while traveling If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it. Somebody testify, testify, testify. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain. One more time. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. 
He's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking Savior. If you got chains, thank goodness. He's the chain breaker. Amen. Please have a seat. testimony now. My name is Tammy Davidson, and this is the testimony of what Christ has done for an imperfect girl. I grew up in a Christian home where my parents were real Christians. They, uh, if they argued, they argued in front of us, and they still served the Lord completely. And it made us realize that living a Christian life was not about us being perfect, but the one inside of us being perfect, which was Jesus. At the age of 13, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior at a revival at the Allert Baptist Church. At that point, I knew that I needed Jesus, and He was there for me and made Himself real to me during that time. I grew up and through many different trials through my life of disobedience to God and to my parents. I went through struggles, but then at a later age, after my two daughters was born, I came to the realization that I needed Christ desperately in my life 
100% at all times in every situation that I faced. And during this time, I was broken and God healed me. He brought me to my knees and he told me, I love you with an everlasting love that I gave my son on the cross for you. Because you were that special to me, because I was struggling at this time with my daughters and letting them visitation and stuff like that because I am from a split family with my daughters. And God told me, I got them. I love you and I love them and I will take care of them. And through that, we have become a blended family that is not perfect, but with Christ, it becomes perfect. And my daughters are wonderful, beautiful women of God who love him and honestly, that wasn't me, that was Jesus, giving them to Jesus. And he raised them for me, him and my mom and dad being there for me. And I cannot say enough how much Jesus has meant to me. If I can tell you anything that will help you through these trials that we face on this earth is surrender to Jesus daily. Look for the good in people. Strive to be what Christ put us here to be, his servants, his tools. Make it where people only see him in you and your life will be a peaceful and loving one. Thank you. But I said, 
Glory to the Son of God. Glory to the Son of God. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. All right. The scripture reading that we had earlier on, I thought it was just right on. And as I think about the greatest commandment is loving our neighbors as ourselves. You know, we, we wouldn't have to have any special ethnic groups called out or we wouldn't have to think about anything if we just loved each other as God wants us to love each other. Amen. Regardless of our skin tones or regardless of our political persuasion, that if we just started loving each other like Jesus wants us to love each other, we'd go a long way. Don't you think? Jesus said they're going to know us to be his disciples by our what? By our love. And sometimes we miss that. The greatest, the greatest part of being a Christian is us experiencing the love of God. But the second greatest is us loving our neighbors as ourselves and as God has loved us. Amen. That's keeping a perspective on things. Uh, I, just, I just saw it this morning. I, I don't do Facebook, but my wife does, and uh, I, I'm the voyeur. I sometimes look at her Facebook and see what's going on. But somebody had done a, what did they call it? It was something Rhapsody uh, from the Bohemian Rhapsody from Queen. Not that I ever heard it, but, you know. Uh, it was hilarious because it was about everybody attacking the other person on, on Facebook and their Twitters and all these people arguing about everything. And it's... Anybody want to agree with me that it's gotten ridiculous? I mean, people are getting mad on Facebook. I mean, you can't see them, you know, so they can say whatever they want to. And it's just, it's crazy. And if we could begin to respond in love and to first not just respond, but act in love towards those people who don't think like us, because we are not the smartest people on the planet. Well, I'm not. So I, there's a chance. There's just a slim chance I could be wrong about a lot of stuff. You know, so my opinions don't matter for a heck of a lot. I, I had somebody tell me one time, they said, you know, teaching is, is when you teach the Bible verse by verse. Preaching is when you give your opinion. <laughs> I hope that's not the case because I want to preach the Bible verse by verse and hopefully telling you what I believe God says. But I guess that's my opinion. So you can't take my opinion to the bank, but you can take God's word to the bank all the time. OK, it's going to be true no matter what. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are our forever God. We thank you that you are unchangeable. We thank you that you are never caught off guard by any situation on this planet, but that you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and you are in control. And we give you praise for that. We thank you, Jesus, for showing your love to us on the cross. We thank you for the promise that you've given us of heaven, and we thank you for the power that you've given us to live while we're here on earth. And we thank you that you're here in our midst today. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you would bring encouragement, that you would bring hope. Lord, that you would just dismantle fear. And Lord, that you would fill us with faith in you. Lord, I pray for those families that are hurting, that are sick, so many that I even know now who have been affected by corona and, and who are struggling. And so, Father, we pray for them. We thank you for each one who can be here today. But we pray for those who can't be here because of sickness and, and hospitals and all those things that are going on in their lives. And we pray that you would minister to them. Father, we pray that you'd speak to each of us here this morning in this room, for those who are listening on the radio, for those who are watching on TV. And we pray that today would be a day of encouragement, a day of hope. And just a day, Lord, of seeing you in your glory. We love you this morning. We pray that you'd speak to us through your word. And that you would enable us by your spirit to do what you speak to us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to begin reading a passage is verse, or the message is based on Philippians 3, 10, and 11. But we're going to back it up a little bit. And uh, we're going to start reading in verse 4. The second part of verse 4 in Philippians chapter 3. Just to get clear. Philippians 3, verse 4. Paul says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh or in his own strength, his own ability, he said, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. 
As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. So when you look at Paul's life from a religious standpoint, this man had it going on. I mean, he was the most religious of the religious. He could trace his spiritual heritage all the way back to the tribe of Benjamin, which most Jews at the time couldn't do that. But he knew where he had come from. He knew how important the law of God was. He had studied it. He knew it beyond most people. And he said, as far as a Jew, I was the one putting the Christians to death. He said, as far as religion goes, I was the top of the food chain. And this is where I was. And I had the right to be respected by others. And look what happens next. Verse 7. He said, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So all these things he says, he says, all of my great accomplishments, everything that I had, all the esteem that I had from, from my peers, he said it means nothing. It was worthless. It was wasted energy. All the things that he had done before really didn't matter. He said the one thing that's most important to me is the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Now, I don't know if you've met any famous people. I've met a lot of people who thought they were famous. You know, I was at a conference one time and I saw Stephen Curtis Chapman. OK, I still swear that's who it was. And so there's a thousand people out here in, in the hallway. And I walk over to him and say, hey, Steve, how are you doing? He just looked at me like, hey, who are you? And we went our separate ways. So, so I say, I know Stephen Curtis Chapman, okay? I, I, I met some other people. We had some friends over in Nashville, and they took us to the Dove Awards. And um, oh, my goodness gracious. So many people patting themselves on the back. It was just kind of, ooh. Then we went to the after party, and that was worse. I thought, y'all don't think you're so much, you know? And you're just people like the rest of us. Uh, when we first went to Europe, as missionaries, and they invited us to go to this conference, okay? It was a nationwide thing, and it was all in the city where we were living. It was at this old Jewish monastery. And so we're there, and we really didn't speak Dutch at all, and we saw a table with about six people that nobody was sitting there, and everybody else was all, you know, had their friends and buddies. So we went over, and we sat down at that table, didn't give it a second thought, began talking to all these people, and kind of became friends with them while we were there. And it wasn't until this day was over that we found out that those were all the TV personalities from the Christian broadcasting thing in Holland. And I'm like, so we know some famous people now, you know? So we felt a little up there, even though we couldn't speak a word of Dutch to them. But, but you meet people, and you know, it, even when you meet famous people, and you think, well, I know him, I know him. H have you all ever had, I'm not meaning to disparage any, but I, I've been in revivals listening to guys speak, and I mean, they drop somebody's name about every two minutes. Of all the famous people they've ever met, and so-and-so said this, and when I was talking to this one, y'all ever heard that? I don't care. You know, because whoever I know that might be famous, nobody compares to Jesus. Amen? You know, and so it doesn't really matter. And, and so, and that's what Paul was saying. He said, I know all the right people. I went to all the right schools. I did all the right stuff. But you know what? It doesn't mean a thing compared to knowing Jesus. What Paul says, I want you to know him. He said, I, when I was with you, I knew nothing but Jesus and him crucified. Now, let's see here. He says, the knowledge of Christ is the greatest thing. But let's get over to verse 10. He said, but I want to know Christ. We just said he knew him. Now he said, I want to really know him. I want to know him in a deep experiential way. I don't want to just have a knowledge of him. Because think about this. While Paul was persecuting Christians, he was persecuting Jesus. And so he knew all about Jesus. He did. He had the information. He just didn't have the regeneration. He had the knowledge. He just didn't know him in a personal way. So he had the book learning. He had knowledge of Jesus from what everybody else said. But he hadn't met him yet. So at that time, he's going to be like a lot of religious people who sit in churches now. Billy Graham, probably over 30 years ago, said that he believed that only about 20% of people sitting in a church pew were saved. That's scary. And I think part of the reason was when he did crusades, most of the people who came went to church. Because back when Billy Graham started in 45 and all the way through the 60s and 70s and 80s, good people went to church, right? I remember when I was a kid and I met somebody who they told me that they didn't go to church anywhere. And I thought, what? But when I went to church, it didn't mean anything. I wasn't a Christian. I just happened to sit there. You know, just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Doesn't work that way. And so Paul knew about Jesus. Well, was he a Christian? 
Could he say where Jesus had come from? Yes, but did that make him a Christian? No. But something amazing happened on the Damascus Road. You remember that? When he met Jesus. He met Jesus, and that changed everything. But here we get in verse 10, and he says, I want to know him in a real personal way. It's one thing to know about somebody, but it's something else to know them. You know, can you imagine that if you lived with somebody for 5 or 10, 15 years, and you still didn't really know them? Now, I'm still surprised by my wife, and she's still surprised by me, and we've been married 40, almost 44 years, and so we're still learning stuff about each other. Uh, when we first began to study Dutch and try to get into the culture, we really couldn't believe that they really thought the way some people told us they thought, that, that their, their mindset, their worldview was just so different from the American mindset and worldview, and it really took us about five years before we really began to understand exactly how they functioned and what the back thing was for the way their minds were. And, and so it, it took a while. We didn't know them, but the more we spent time with them, the better we knew them. And what Paul is saying, how I want to know Jesus, is going to become through experience. And see, this is what should happen. As we say our faith grows, really what should be happening is our relationship is growing. And we're growing deeper and deeper in our knowledge of Jesus. And not just up here, but you learn to trust him more. That way you don't get scared when things like the coronavirus come. That way you don't get scared when it looks like you might lose your job because you've seen him come through over and over and over. You know him personally and you know he's not going to disappoint you. You know him personally and you know that he's going to take care of your needs because that's what he promised. And you've seen him do it time and time again. You look at Abraham's life, the father of our faith. But when he started out, you know, he's lying about stuff. He's lying about who he's married to. He's taking things into his own hands over and over. You go many years down the road, God told him to sacrifice his son. He said, okay. Because he was convinced that if he did, that God could bring him back to life. That's how his faith had grown, because his relationship with God got deeper and deeper and deeper. He got to know him. So Paul said, listen, when I got saved, I counted everything else as garbage, meaningless compared to knowing Christ. And then we get just a few verses further. He says, but I really, really, really want to know him. Above anything else in life, I want to know Jesus. See, we, we have classes that teach us doctrine. We have classes that teach us how to do so many things, become better Christians, become better stewards, become better this and that. But the better thing that we can get is to know Jesus better than anything, just to know him. You know, it's, if y'all have been married very long, you know that you know, life can get going fast. And, and sometimes Kim and I, now we're eating out a lot because we're trying to move and there's no food in the house and it's just kind of crazy. And now going out is kind of a pain because you've got to wear the mask as you walk into the restaurant. Then take it off so that you can eat. Life is good. But when you do it a lot, it's just what you're doing. And sometimes, though, when you actually have a date, y'all remember those? Okay? It's when you sit across from the table and you look at each other and say, dang, that's why I love you. Girl, you're good looking. And, and sit there and you start talking about things and, and you know, you have good conversations. You're like, I didn't know you felt that way anymore. Oh, I didn't know that. And so he goes deeper. Well, this is what we do with Jesus. This is how we get to know him more personally. We talk to him more. We spend more time and we can learn about him from his word. But then we're like, Lord, I want to know you in the things that I see that you've revealed yourself as. See, there's great big words for God. He's omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. He's omniscient. That means he knows everything. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at all times. And, and so it's one thing to know that in your head and know the theology of it. But it's a whole nother one to know that when I'm on the road, Jesus is there with me. When I'm considering road rage, he's calm and peaceful right there with me. And I have to realize I need to find that calmness from him. I need to get him to calm me down. When we have crazy clients, I want to hurt them. And I remember that's not what Jesus would do. Because I'm, I'm experiencing this life with him. I realize that he is everywhere with me. And then I realize that, that again, that he knows what I'm going through. That's the kind of God that he is. So we grow in that personal knowledge of him. And that's what Paul was saying. I want to know him in a deep, experiential way. Not just about him, but I want to know him. Now we can learn more about him when we fellowship together. That's why we do Sunday school. That's why we do get together, so that we can learn from each other in our relationship with Jesus. That's why we have prayer, so that we can spend more time with Him. That's why He gave us His Word, so we can know the facts, and then begin to put it into our lives. That's the beauty of it. See, it's one thing to read the Word, it's the other, the other one to say, Lord, make that a part of who I am. You know, I think I've said this before, I was in a church once, and always oh, Sunday morning, they came around, how many daily Bible readers? You know, and I did it, I did it. I wanted to change it and say, how many Bible doers? That's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? One thing to know about it, it's another thing to do it. Well, let's see. Let's just go a little bit further. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Power is always good, right? We always want more power. I had a pastor friend tell me, knowledge is power. And what came into my mind, first of all, was, yeah, knowledge puffs up. 
Okay? Just because you know stuff doesn't make you more important. But as we look at this, he said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Think about that. He was a dead body in a grave, and God raised him from the dead. That's pretty amazing. That's power. And from what the scripture says, that that same power that raised Christ from the dead, now what? Dwells in us. And so Paul, the one who wrote those words, said, that's how I want to know him. I want to know him personally in a deeper way than I've ever known him before, but I want to know him in a powerful way as well. I want to see his working in my life. I want to watch him supply and meet my needs. Do y'all ever pray and say, Lord, I just want to see you shine. Lord, I want to see you do what you promised you were going to do, and we'll give you all the glory for it. And we see him in his power. We see him providing in ways when, things, when there seems to be no way. When we're all chained up and we find him that, you know, he's the chain breaker. Those songs that we sang, it's like we, we begin to learn that he's those things. And then when life gets hard, we're okay. We're okay. It doesn't mean we don't have those moments of fear and doubt, but we go back to him and we remember who he is and we know him in his power. When we're feeling all weak and drained out, we experience his power because his power is made perfect in our weakness. See? So we get to see him more and more. Want to know him the power of his resurrection. Uh, I started thinking... My wife had run a renovation business for, for years, and I help her out occasionally. And uh, I've learned the secret of great power tools. <laughs> they make power tools for everything. And the more I find that when you've got the right tool for the right job, life is good, right? Any of y'all ever used a handsaw? You remember those? Trying to cut across, you know, like a two-by-six or something, and you're cutting that thing with a handsaw? That ain't good for you. <laughs> you know? Power saw. So you get the power saw, you're done. It's over. It's fantastic. We have a good friend who's a carpenter. And uh, in fact, he lives over in, outside of Allen's. And this guy is like, his power saw is just an extension of his hand. It is crazy. And the first time I saw him with it, I thought, man, you are insane and lost your mind. Because he'd get that thing up over here. You know, he'd hold a, 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 a beam or something, you know, a two before on his leg. And he'd cut that thing off. And I thought... <laughs> A little crazy. But he knew how to use his power tools. You know, they were just an extension of who he was. And people who do carpentry and all that stuff all the time, they don't even think about it. I have noticed most good carpenters are missing at least one finger. <laughs> you know, it happens. He still, well, he did cut one end off. But, but, but they use them all the time. Now think about this. For us, if we want to know him in the power of his resurrection, we got to stay plugged in. Right? Okay, I started to bring my power saw just to, to let you see what it does. Because when it's not plugged in, what's it do? Nothing. You can pull that little trigger all you want to. It's just going to sit there. There's no power to it. And then they came up with the magic of batteries. You know, I love my DeWalt's. And, and so they really run great. But when they get under a lot of stress for an extended period of time, what happens? Battery runs down. And see, for a lot of us as Christians, we're just battery operated. We go from one recharge to the next. We go to church and we get charged up and we love it. And we love Jesus on Sunday. Then Monday comes, the battery's drained. Because we're not plugged in. See, batteries are great, but you've always got to go back and plug them in as well. And so for us to live the power of the resurrection life, we've got to stay plugged in. Jesus called it abiding in the vine, John chapter 15. Basically, if you stay plugged into me, I'm going to stay plugged into you, and you're going to produce much fruit. But apart from me, if you pull the plug, you got nothing. And that's a good question for us this morning. Am I plugged in? Because that's the power of the resurrection. Staying close to him. It's not about our power. It's not about what we can do, but it's about what he can do. And you just think about it. If you had that handsaw that's doing life on your own, that's unregenerate, that's not knowing Jesus, and you got that thing, and man, you're going at it, and you're sweating up a storm, and your arm's about to kill you, but by golly, you're going to get it done. You're going to get that house built in 40 years. <laughs> and so you're wearing yourself out. And then suddenly you come to know Jesus and realize, wait a minute. One, I got somebody to do this with me. So you remember those saws, the two-sided saws, you know, and they'd cut logs with those things. And you got somebody else on the other side. Imagine trying to do that on your own. When you come to know Jesus, it gets even better. You got the sawmill all plugged in and ready to go. And what we've got to realize, are you plugged in to Jesus? Do you just know about him or are you really connected to him? See, I, I mean, I, for years, I told you all I was in church and some of you all grew up in church but didn't get saved until you got later and got, got older. Because we knew about him. We knew the stuff. You know, I, I always believed that Jesus was the Son of God because I grew up hearing that. I had no idea what that meant, but I believed it. And, and so then I believed in heaven. I believed in hell because that's the way I brought up. But it didn't change my life. 
But when I met Jesus and suddenly got plugged into the source of life, everything changed. The lights came on. All of a sudden, I did find that I had power over sin. That's the power of the resurrection is what that's about. We don't have to keep on sinning anymore. We don't. Because the power of God is in us. And that's what Paul was saying. That's what I want to know. Power over the grave. To where I'm no longer walking in grave clothes. I'm no longer living like I didn't have Christ in my life. I'm no longer just living on my own. But I realize I've got the power flowing through me to live a life that's pleasing to Him. I don't have to stress and strain and try harder. I don't have to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I have to rely on Him. Fully relying on God. That's what it's all about. And that's what Paul said. That's how I want to know him. Uh, uh, reading through the Old Testament, Asa was a good king. Right up till the end. And then he just did make some decisions on his own. And God was not pleased with that. And he had made good decisions up to that point. And he always asked the Lord. But as he got older, it was like, let's just do it this way. God was not pleased with him. And see, sometimes we learn when we start out, like Paul said to the Galatians, you've started by the Spirit, but now you're trying to be made perfect in the flesh. It's like you started out plugged in, cutting up those boards, doing everything you needed to do, and now all of a sudden you're disconnected and think you're going to do okay. We're never supposed to be on our own. We need Him. This is what Paul said, the great Apostle Paul. I want to know Him. I thought, I thought you did, Paul. No, I want to know Him more. I don't want to know Him in the power of his resurrection and the power of a new life. Y'all, if we're going to be salt and light, we got we to stay near the salt lick. You know, we got to keep coming back to Jesus. And, and then we can be the salt of the world, the light to the world. That's what he wants us to be, but we got to stay connected to him. Stay plugged in. Let's look a little further. This gets crazy here. In the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I'll say that I want to know him painfully. I like power. I'm not so crazy about pain. I do not like pain. I don't like needles. I don't pass out. I'm not that wimpy. But I don't like them. I don't like the idea of trials. Right now our life's moving along pretty good. A lot of good stuff going on. And I remember the days of trials. And I don't particularly want to go back there. I lived through a time for a while. I really thought the great tribulation had come. You know what I mean? And it was really like, Lord, if I'm living in it, then just bring it on. You know, let's just do this. But I enjoy the times of peace a lot more. But we look at this and Paul said, if I want to know him, he suffered for my sin. Scripture says that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Oh my goodness. Rejection by his own family. Rejected by his own people. Then to death on a cross. Did he know suffering? Yes, he did. And if we're going to know him in that way, then we've got to also know him in his suffering. And what the scripture talks about that is the crucified life. Paul said, listen, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. So we have to first recognize that there's got to be a crucifixion. There's got to be a burial of our old self and our own self-reliance before we can really experience the new life and the resurrection. Amen? Yeah. We come to that point on a day-by-day -day basis to say, Lord, it's no longer I that liveth, but it's you that lives in me. And so help me to die to my own desires because I want to hurt some people today. I want to say some things back to them that they said to me. I want to get even with them or at least I want you to get even with them. And that's my flesh. Because God wants me to forgive them. God wants me to love them. Wow. So what has to happen? Sam's got to die. Jesus has to live. Because what I want is not always what he wants. And that's the crucified life. Listen, Paul so many times, you know he wanted to kick back. You know he wanted to fight back. But he knew if God was in control, then God was in control. God would shut doors. He'd have to go to other places. God would lock him up in prison. He just wrote letters. We'd go kicking and screaming, wouldn't we? I don't deserve this. That's the old man. Say, Jesus, I want you to live through me. And if you're going to be glorified in my suffering right now, then you be glorified in my suffering. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean we won't get corona. We now have some really good friends who the whole family's got it. And it's being tough on them. It does happen. You know, so we can say, I trust in God, but this stuff happens. Are we still going to praise Him? How many people have you all known who are dying of cancer and gave God the glory through it all, and they suffered through it right up till the day they died, and, and they, they were faithful to the end? To the end. And I think, you know, is that where we're willing to go? And if, Lord, if I have to suffer for you to become more like you, I won't say bring it on, but, Lord, I'll do that because I want to be more like you. And if you're going through a time of suffering right now and it's not feeling like there's much power to it, it'll be there. It'll be there. Those who wait upon the Lord 
will renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings of eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Time's coming. All those songs you sang about heaven someday, it's real. It's real. Jesus has overcome the world. Let's look a little bit further. He said, I want to know him in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection. You know, I want to know him in a real practical way. I want to live that life. Now look what he says there a little bit further, verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained all this. He said, I don't know him the way I want to know him yet. I don't know him in the power of his resurrection as fully as I want to know him yet. I don't know him in the, in the fellowship of his sufferings like I want to know him yet. He said, I'm not there yet. And one day there's going to be the resurrection from the dead. We're all going up. We're going to be with him. We're going to see in all his glory. But what Paul says, I'm not there yet. And none of us are there yet. I've said it over and over. We're just works in progress. Thank God that he's still working. Amen? Amen? And to be more like him, I have not obtained all this. Or I have not been made perfect yet. Wow. But what I do is I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I love that. He says, I press on. He, what do you mean? I, I, it's like I'm running the race and I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to look back. I'm just going to press on. I'm going to keep going no matter how hard it gets. I'm not going to grow weary in well-doing. I'm not going to give up my faith. I'm going to fight like a f good fighter. I, I'm going to run the race like a good athlete. I'm going to finish this thing. And that's what Paul was saying. What I'm going to press on for is to take hold. What the word means is to take down. Okay? It's like you're in a football game and the quarterback, and man, he's just flying down there and you're going to take him down. You're just going to keep running until you get him because you're going to stop him so he doesn't score. This is what he's saying. This is what I, I, I press on so that I can take hold and grab hold of everything that Jesus grabbed hold of me for. What did Jesus grab hold of us for? Just to give us, you know, freedom from, you know, from the grave and from death? Yeah. To save us, but also so that we can live a new life. Well, that was the song we sang. Good, good choice. You know, so that we can, there's a better life. There really is. We don't have to live humdrum like everybody else. We don't have to live defeated lives. We don't have to be depressed and anxious and, and, and all those other things. He says, we can have this new life in Jesus. And Paul says, I'm going to press on for it. When I start feeling like I, I've lost my grip, when I start feeling like I, I don't see Jesus like I did, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep moving closer to him. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep on until I see him face to face someday. He said, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Is he perfect yet? No. Verse 13. Brothers, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it yet. He said, I press on to take hold of it, but I'm not there yet. You know, it's when you're praying for family members, you know, well, they're not saved yet. When your finances are going down and you don't know how you're going to pay your next bill. Yet. God is the God of yet. God is the God of still to come. You know, because his promises are yea and amen. We can count on him. And what Paul's saying is, I don't see all this even myself yet. But I keep going because I'm going to see him face to face. It's all going to be worth it. I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I forget what's behind. I'm 64 almost. I forget stuff a lot. And there's a lot of stuff in my past I would like to forget. There's things in our, my past that my wife has not forgotten yet. And, and, and I have. I have. I tried to. But as we look at this, this is what Paul is saying. And remember, you've got to go back in these verses a little bit when he's saying all those things I did before. He said, I just forget about that. Who I was before Christ, listen, it embarrasses me. Who I was, not just what I did, but it embarrasses me. You know, I, I've never been to a high school reunion. Not for that reason, I've been out of the country, a lot of it, but, but it's like, dang, I don't, I don't want to go back and remember what I was like when I was a junior and a sophomore and, you know, halfway through my senior year even. After I met Jesus, we'll talk about that, but before, I mean, that's just embarrassing. Paul says, I, I don't stay there. I don't go back there. I don't go back to my past accomplishments. I don't go back to when I did walk with Jesus. He said, I'm just going to leave that. He said, I'm going to strain. Get these words here. He's very much involved in this. For us as Christians, we so often get laid back and say, God, whatever you want to do. Paul said, I strain, I press, I draw near. He said, I, I work at this thing. It doesn't just happen. You want a good marriage? It doesn't just happen. You want good kids? It doesn't just happen. You want to move up in your business? It doesn't just happen. There's our part. And we do it when we're plugged into him. To where it's not us stressing and straining. We're drawing our strength from him. And we move forward in him. Whew. That's what Paul says. Listen, I'm going to strain toward, towards what's ahead. And get this, I press on 
towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Pressing on. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights. On the so many good songs. But if we could just make them part of our lives. Don't just lay back in your Christian life. Pursue him. That you might know him personally, powerfully, painfully, practically. To where the evidence of your life in Christ is seen day by day. And don't give up. Just don't give up. You know, just keep going. Uh, we, you should be closer to Jesus today than we were yesterday. We should be closer to Jesus next week than we were two weeks ago. You know, if you were saved and you don't see a whole lot of difference, you probably didn't get saved. Because he's going to change you from glory to glory. He's going to keep working on you. That's his promise. God is faithful. But you press in too. You, you pursue him. You know, pursue him relentlessly. Because Jesus called you out. Just call back. Just go looking for him. You know, and, and, and just fall in love with him again. That's what Paul said. I just want to know him. Just want to know him. We had a couple this week, clients, and uh, they were ready to buy this house. They're all good for it, and they're all excited. And they're living in this little bitty place right now, and they're all excited. And they called, and the guy said, okay, we're not going to buy the house. We're going to get divorced. Okay. Well, my wife was talking to him, and, and, he's, and, and it was so beautiful. I sat there and listened to it. And she's just counseling with him. You know, here's what you're going through. You know, you're living in this little house, the stress of buying a new place. And, you know, you guys, you're going to be okay. Just don't give up right now. And next day he calls back, we want the house. You know, but he had to persevere. They had to work some stuff through. They had to pursue the relationship. They had to lean in. They had to dig closer. They had to not give up. And they're fine. And for us, in our relationship with Jesus, it's like, let's just talk again. If you're feeling estranged from him, he hasn't moved. You draw close. You press near. You draw near. Like what Paul was saying there. Listen, do you know him this morning? Not just about him, but know him in a personal way. As your Lord and Savior. Not the Lord and Savior. Yours. And do you know him? Are you experiencing the power? Or are you just overcome by sin? Overcome by worry? Overcome by grief? Listen, he wants to take you through that and take you over that. Okay? He wants to take you out of the grave like he did Lazarus and bring you into a whole new life. That's what Jesus wants to do. Because as believers, we can, we can get bogged down and he wants us to move forward. So if you don't know him, I want to invite you to come to him this morning. If you do know him, I want to invite you to draw near and to press on. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much that you revealed yourself to us in your word. And then, Lord, when we come to know you, you reveal yourself to us in such a personal way. That you become our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray for any here this morning who don't know you, who just know about religion and just know about the Christian life and no church, but they don't know you. And I pray this morning they would call upon you to be saved and to have that relationship with you. Lord, I pray for believers here who are, who are worried and who are stressed and, and who feel like they're on their own. Lord, I pray that they just get reconnected with you. Lord, that they would just get supercharged by the power of your Holy Spirit in their lives. And Father, we pray that we would all press on to know you more, to know you better, to know you more deeply. And so Lord, we, we pray that you would have your way in this invitation time right now. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
we draw our strength is near to the heart of God. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. Again, for this day, thank you for each one who's here. Lord, I pray for your blessing as we go out today. And Lord, as we come back this evening to, to draw close to you again. We just thank you for your goodness and your love. We give you praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Search Committee, if you could meet here just for a minute, please. That means he's firing me.